Hi, everyone. Um, happy Wellness Wednesday and kickoff day for our OUSD Staff Health and Wellness Fair. Um, I will be sharing the link to the fair um, at the end of the session so that you can go and explore and um, find you know, really great tools and resources, access to other webinars. Um, many of you are part of this, um, this virtual professional development series and some of you are joining for the first time as part of the wellness webinar series um, through the, the, the fair. So welcome if you're with us for the first time and welcome back if um, this is your, um, your learning community. Um, I would like to introduce um, Kelly Kenoki and I'll be turning it over to her in a second. Um, Kelly is, as my, and sounds like many of you are um, part of um, Kelly's extended educator family already. Um, Kelly is executive director for the Teaching Well um, and a former Oakland educator and founded the Teaching Well to really care for educator well-being so that um, educators can thrive and stay in the profession doing really their, their best work um, over the long term. Um, and I'll let Kelly share a little bit more. Um, this session is fo focused on herd immunity, um, exploring collective care. Um, and that is, uh, so if you joined the previous session with Kelly a couple weeks ago, uh, we'll be going deeper. And if you're joining us for the first time, it should be um, very accessible for you. You should be able to dive right in with us on the content. Um, so hopefully it, um, it's um, accessible really for everyone on the call. Um, I will go ahead and turn it over to Kelly. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Mara, so much for having us um, and joining, creating this wellness fair. I know the time it took to coordinate all these opportunities for Oakland educators over the next couple days, and they're going to be fantastic. Um, my team is going to be doing a um, nutrition webinar, just how to fuel your body in the context of COVID on Thursday at 2 p.m. So feel free to check that out. I am, I'm just, I'm tallying where we're all from. And I just want to make a big shout out to middle school because that is our majority group right now and kind of perfect, although I'm so happy to be with all of you, is that this is new content that I created and um, it'll just be so great to be in community with all of you while we navigate it together. And this content came from our last webinar where um, we were sharing a lot of just the context of COVID-19 as a collective trauma and then self-care tools. And at the end, I talked about this concept of herd immunity, which I'll share a little bit more about later. Um, and it just light bulbs kind of came off in the room and Mara's like, could you dive deeper into that? So that's the heart of this um, training and I haven't fully articulated in these visuals before. So I'm gonna really invite you at the end of the session inside the living document is access to um, a survey and I would love your feedback. Um, and I just added in the chat box access to the slides and living document for anyone that's come on in the last minute or so. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and um, maybe just do a brief intro of me, but really get to the heart of the work. Uh, Chrome. Perfect. All right. I see some people have already accessed the living document. This document guides us through an access to slides, just brief intro to Zoom, and also some resources for further reading. Um, a lot of the concepts that I'm gonna be sharing with you today are my interpretation and my um, the Teaching Well's kind of collective embodiment of practices of collective care and self-care. And so I really wanna lift up some amazing leaders in the space. Um, Adrienne Marie Brown with her work and her blogs. I've lifted several blogs from her for to, to share. Arundhati Roy, Joanna Macy, um, as women who are leading the way and talking about how to care at a societal level. And so from there, I'm gonna move to the slides and put it into present mode. And um, I'm gonna just start with the agreements and dive right in. So in our space and all teaching well spaces, this is a time to care for you. So we identify that as body liberatory. Um, and that means that you have some tea, you have some food, you have some water. Uh, if you need to stretch in the middle of this session, if this is the only time that you get to learn about this, but you're running around following your kid with your headphones on, do you. 
really, really grateful that you're here and that you're listening. Um, and that if you are moving around a lot, just inviting you to turn off your camera during that time. We would love to see your faces if you feel comfortable sharing your face with us. And we also want to respect the screen time you've had and um, just respect that if there's a lot of movement going on, turning off your camera will be helpful for all of us. Two, um, I am, I'm a facilitator of this work. I'm deeply curious. I started an OUSD as an educator at Westlake Middle School and then spent a couple years at Life Academy building a social emotional curriculum. And I think people on the line can tell you I was not perfect at self-care as an educator and I was deeply fascinated by how to be better at it. And through that, I built community with other OUSD educators through a donation-based yoga class. Um, at Westlake after hours and then also just was continuing to open be open to learning more and to give time for other educators to learn about this and learn from themselves. So um, I really want you to be open to learning and then I also want to name that we're going to be doing some somatic practices and that you are I'm going to be directing your body and you are the ultimate agent and sovereign person of your own body and so um, if at any time something I share or some invitation I have is like, you're like, mm, that does not feel good in my body. I fully invite you to listen to what your body has to say. And at this time, I would really invite you to have an exit ramp in mind. So something that you already have in your toolkit to reset your nervous system when things get uncomfortable. Um, and that could be something as turning off your screen for 30 seconds. Um, just closing your eyes, maybe just rubbing your shoulders. Can you give me a thumbs up or put in the chat box a thumbs up that you have an exit ramp in mind for the rest of the session today? Awesome, thanks Joan. Great, thank you. All right, the last agreement that I have is just to ask for what you need. The collective learning that we're going to do today is based on all of us bringing our own input. So I'm going to invite you to both ask for what you need in the chat box or by raising your hand. Um, or if you want me to talk more about a specific topic, asking for more time. And be willing to offer your expertise. I know there are people on the line that have taught longer than me. Um, I am a stepmom to two children, but people who have had children longer than me. Um, and so this is not, um, this is a time for all of us to share what is, what our gifts are and how we've been resourcing us through this time of uncertainty. And so I really invite you to share and be in dialogue. We're not gonna do any breakout sessions today. I'm gonna have some interactive activities, um, but, I really will give time at the end of the session for people to lift up questions, whether through the chat box or through sharing um, by sharing on you through your video. Um, and I'd love for you to participate in whatever way you can. All right, so we're gonna start with a activity, a mindfulness activity to just ground into our bodies. And so I'm gonna invite you to do what is called a sensory deprivation technique. So you're gonna readjust yourself in your chair if you feel comfortable. And then I'm gonna invite you to turn down the volume on your computer to the lowest volume with which you can still hear me, okay? And then I'm gonna invite you to turn your video off so that you can just come into yourself. And when you've done all those things, I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes and using the cups of your hands, cover your eyes with your hands. And seeing if you can really close out all the light. If you don't feel comfortable touching your face with your hands, you can cover your eyes with your forearms or with a cloth. And then begin to notice your breath with your eyes covered in the darkness. And as I notice my own breath, I wanna take a deep exhale, so I will now. <sighs> Relaxing into the chair, feeling the feet on the floor. And then just noticing the sensations of the eyes as they readjust to the dark environment.
feeling the eyelids, noticing if there's any color behind the eyelids. Seeing if you can relax the outside edges of the eyes or imagine relaxing your ears. And from this place, you may notice that your senses have heightened. Feeling the clothes on your skin. You're hearing more peaked, hearing sounds outside or further away. Hearing sounds close by. Taking a deep breath here and exhaling through the mouth. One more breath. And then keeping the eyes closed, allow the hands to fall away and just notice the color on the back of the eyelids. Keeping your breath long and steady. Begin to imagine the room you're in now, focusing on objects or views that bring you joy. Keeping your eyes closed as long as you can, but shifting your body to a visual that brings you joy in your environment. And then when you're ready, I'm gonna invite you to flutter your eyes open softly, taking in this object or view of joy. Seeing if you can notice details you didn't see before. Maybe you see the work behind it, those who built the object. Taking one more breath here. And then when you're ready, bringing yourself back to your computer and turning on your video if you feel comfortable. So one of the things that you already may, some of you may already know about the teaching well is that we are really committed to the body's innate miraculous intelligence, and that our bodies oftentimes know what to do to calm ourselves down or to reset our nervous system better than our minds do. And so this, these activities that I just brought you through today are um, first this idea of sensory deprivation. So there's a couple things. When we're looking at screens, we actually blink half as much. So that means that our eyes have less water moving through them. And it means that there's oftentimes more muscle strain or likelihood of dryness, pain, or infection. And so just by closing your eyes for, we just did that for three minutes, is a way to allow the eye to heal itself and reset when it's working with this foreign environment, okay? Um, also with sensory deprivation, one of the things that inspired this activity is that my, I'm staying at my parents' house and uh, they have a bathroom downstairs that doesn't get light. And so I went in and I'm, I broke my ankle, so I'm on crutches, so I can't really f finagle my way around. So I actually closed the door without light and I was like, oh my God, it's so nice and dark in here. And I watched my body like respond to just being in the dark in a safe environment. And so um, this is an activity that you can do with your peers um, in that way. The other fact is at the bottom, um, that is a study from scientists that if while working virtually, if you can look up from your computer every 20 minutes and you can look 20 feet away for at least 20 seconds, that you can reset the visual cortex. 
um, and help your brain increase the vitality and activity of the brain. So our, our, our bodies are not trained to be looking so nearsighted um, at a really complex object that is plastic and glass and not a human for long periods of time. And so this tool has been really valuable for me um, and it gives me cause and reason for why I look out the window every you know, 30 minutes and kind of space out. Um, that this is actually my body trying to find a way to reset and actually be able to focus again on the task at hand. If you want to share what that was like in the chat box or any questions you have, we'll bring up those questions later. And so the topic of today's webinar is this concept of herd immunity. And the concept um, came up in, I was on a women's call a couple weeks ago with like 15 um, friends from, from like, my early 20s and a woman at the end of the call was like you know this call felt like herd immunity where when i was alone and by myself i felt this sense of fear but after coming on this call i feel this sense of vitality and trust that i'm not going through this alone and that concept of herd immunity really struck me and so i did a lot of i did research around what you know to fine tune what that meant and it's a, obviously a public health term and it's talking about the rate of people that need to be inoculated from a given disease in order for the whole herd or the whole society to be able to be immune um, and not be able to pass or transmit this disease examples are polio measles right and um and we don't actually have that for COVID-19, right? So I'm not talking about herd immunity from the context of medicine, but I had this idea, well, what about if we could inoculate ourselves from fear? Um, and it really struck me as a really great way to talk about how to tend to ourselves and how to tend to each other um, with the uncertainty of this unknown, um, this unknown virus, and then the massive implications that we've all gone through as a society to control and manage the spread of this virus. And so while we can't control that, we definitely can control how we respond to fear and then how we are with our community so that everyone in our community as best as possible can be able to um, access their most vital self. So that's gonna be the topic of this conversation today. Um, and I don't think, I think the first tool that we can use to inoculate ourselves from fear is to acknowledge the reality of our situation. Um, and so I'm going to start with gratitude for state and city systems who help flatten the curve, for frontline health workers who have been putting their lives on the line to make sure that this um, virus is contained, and then you all as educators who are doing a ginormous change to transition to virtual learning and be able to show up for your, for your, your students as well as show up for your families. Um, and so those acknowledgements and gratitude are really important to me because they lift up that this could have been worse, but we collectively came together in a moment of crisis to provide safety for our community and I couldn't move forward without acknowledging that this work has statistically hit communities of color, indigenous populations, and marginalized populations at a greater statistical rate than the rest of the population, and that this response to the crisis is still falling along lines of race and class. And, um, and so in the context of a system that is not actually collectively caring for all people, how do we as service providers ensure that there's care for as many people as possible and simultaneously care for ourselves to move through this crisis for the long run. Um, and so the next part that I personally do after I acknowledge the context is to really be able to name what my fear is about. And what I have identified in a story that has really worked for me is this idea that COVID-19 is a collective trauma. And so that collective trauma initially was like, oh my gosh, may I might get the virus or my family member might get the virus or my students might get the virus. But what our bodies, there's more to it. There's the financial insecurity. 41% of people are food insecure. We have a fear of death, a loss of routine, a loss of safety. And so some of us are transmuting this collective trauma through actually 
recent having this virus, but a lot of us are also still processing the collective trauma and that fear that is going through our society in other ways. So whether that's an increased sense of anxiety, increased anger, feelings of grief, or a desire to fix and do even more work to compensate for your safety, we are all trying the best we can. If you notice, I put someone with a broken ankle because I did break my ankle one week before shelter in place and um, feel like it's been a transformative part in how I've been moving with this trauma of COVID. But our individual bodies do what we can with the collective energy in our environment to transmute and move the energy through. And so this normalizes all of our experiences, no matter what your experience is, and knows that us doing the best we can and navigating our own fear is actually going to help us transform this collective system. Because we are just at the beginning of this crisis. So I've been trying to, I've been navigating the story of like, we don't know what the fall's gonna look like. I'm working with a lot of principals who are like, I'm making seven different scenarios about how my school year is gonna start. And so I think it's really important to land collective and self-care of educators and of providers in the context of this longer story. So if we break up this COVID-19 collective trauma into three sections, I think the first section is the crisis, where we respond quickly towards safety and support for those that are most vulnerable and making sure that we are safe and supported. After that infrastructure is stabilized, all of our students got their computers, we opened our health centers to get food for everybody. The following stage that's probably going to hit many of us after the school year closes is reflection and recovery. So now that that infrastructure is stabilized, how are we as frontline care providers recovering emotionally and physically and with family in order to be able to renew next year and feel vitality and, a, and from a place of service again. Um, and so how we do this reflection and recovery period over the course of the summer and how we invest in the balance of collective care for ourselves and others as well as self-care for ourselves is the difference between us coming back to work and feeling a sense of exhaustion and perpetrating systems that are not serving our young people or the opportunity to take this new, this uncertainty and be creative and imagine something different. Um, and so that is where I'm couching all of the support today is this deep belief that one, you ultimately deserve care and the concept and time to reflect on it. But that two, I have this deep belief that if we care for ourselves, we are going to create a even better outcome for our young people at the end of this crisis or in the renewal period of the crisis. Um, hold on, before I go there, are there any questions, Mara, that you could lift or any reflections that you wanna share personally? as like the Director of Health and Wellness in OUSD. I don't see any question, oh, let's see, 41, <clears throat> there's a question that's coming up in the chat. 41% of people are experiencing food insecurity, is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, confirmation. Um, no, not not particularly. I mean, I just really appreciate this um, this way of rethinking about herd immunity because we have been so focused on um, on combating COVID nineteen um, in the from the public health perspective and really thinking about you know um, searching for a vaccine and. Um, how can we all protect ourselves in terms of hand washing and wearing masks and um, and the news cycle is just so overwhelming and meanwhile kind of the fear piece um, and the <clears throat> the response to uncertainty is is ramping up and we are um, I, I feel it in my own body and experience just the kind of the rising um, worries and the inability to sleep and the really, um, it's, it's hard to, to get back to my body. And so thinking about how I can take care of myself and how I can support my team and my colleagues to take care of themselves and to connect to their own experience and get grounded 
-hmm. and then also to get grounded in our relationships with one another uh, feels like a really powerful concept and it's something that's within within our control uh, right. because everything else is so far outside of our control yeah. um, so I just really appreciate that that concept and I think it's really powerful to think about in school communities and in um, central departments how we how how do we get grounded in our selves and in our relationships with one another. Yeah. I love that. Thanks for that reflection. And I think so much of what we'll talk about today is under the context that we as service providers, as people naturally drawn to give care, um, have an expanded sense of control, locus of control, to be able to be like, I want to create a classroom where this is the environment, that I am the climate control of this environment. And when a pandemic hits, <laughs> And that concept of what the classroom looks like totally changes. Um, and that we are facing our own insecurity and own discomfort, um, whether that's family members or um, being in our homes and working and having to provide care um, or feeling, you know, the harm of our system continuing to, you know, oppress um, so many of the people that we love. It's, it's real. You know, and so I just think that that it's a great time to just be able to name it and that naming it is the first step. And then for me, getting back in my body is number two. So the things, the ideas that came to me when, I, when you were sharing is this idea, if you want to place a foot on the ground, and I want you to maybe even close your eyes and just invite you to put all your awareness into even just one foot. Maybe feel all five toes individually touch the floor. And then just rocking on the inside and outside of that foot. And then taking one deep breath in and taking one deep breath out. That this is that brief of a tool and doing that as long as you need is a way that you can ground yourself when leading a meeting or that when a, you know, that you can add into a meeting to just get people back in their bodies. And the science behind that is so cool. So it's like the longest nerve is the sciatic nerve and it starts in the back and the spinal cord and goes all the way down to the bottom of the foot. And um, when we are on computers, we're really working from like the brain, maybe the voice, or maybe kind of using our abs, but if we can access um, and activate the nerves that are going all the way down to the bottom of our foot, make it the primary focus, we actually create space for our body to reset itself and for us to kind of not worry about things out of the locus of our control and pull our locus of control inward. Um, and then I just want to name about media is that since two, specifically since the 2001, um, um, you know, New York Tower attacks, it has been completely created to increase the sense of uncertainty and fear. It is branded, it is marketed, it uses the color scheme, it uses 24 hour breaking news. And so while it's so important that we understand enough about our infrastructure and how government is running and the choices that are being made to be able to be informed. I really invite you that if you start feeling a sense of anxiety in your body after watching news, that you just remind yourself, you're like, oh, it's created to do this in my body because it creates a, it creates a feedback loop where I want to stay and I want to learn more and I feel a fear and uncertainty of being safe in my own home. Um, and so just naming that that's like how it's built can give you freedom and give, for me, gives me freedom in play to be like, oh, feeling anxious, going to turn off my news for another, for an hour. And I'm going to go back to um, spending time with my family or drawing or finding something that creates safety and soothingness in my environment inside the context of safety I have and the privilege I have. Um, and so I'm going to take this as a moment to transition us into um, a new, you know, what you've seen in our work traditionally is this really this concept of self-care. And self-care based on the, the premise that as service providers who give so much, we oftentimes as a community um, don't have the natural training or, or um, inclination to prioritize the balance 
of caring for others and caring for ourselves. Um, and so it's never been coming from like, let's get more selfish, let's not care about other people as much, but more about how do I continue to use self-care tools to refuel my body so that I could continue to be of service to the people that matter to me. Um, and there's been so much conversation about the, uh, the whiteness of self-care or the consumerist nature of self-care and that there's these larger ideas that are culturally often held um, around like collective care or Adrian Marie Brown talks about like the mix of those two as called self-determined care. And so in the living document, I just invite you, these are people that I deeply respect who have been diving into this work more deeply to feel free to check them out. Um, but I'm going to take this, the synthesis of what I've really felt about in collective care and then how it merges and blends with self-care. So when we're talking about collective care, we're talking about a larger group of people beyond just one person, beyond, you know, it can be a nuclear family, it could be um, a extended family, it could be a school system, it could be the whole country, right? But it's this idea that there's, you are part of something larger than yourself, and that these are the different components that I see as true when we think about collective care, no matter the activity. Um, so these are the four ways that I've broken down collective care. And when Mara saw this last, there were like eight different ideas. And I'm gonna blend those into these four. But when I really narrowed in on what was collective care to me and how this blended with self-care, it started with reverence. So a huge gift that we can give to ourselves and give to the rest of our community is reverence for things that are beyond our comprehension. So that can be reverence for ancestors, for the lives they lived and the choices they made to be able to live here today. This could be reverence for nature, how nature goes through its seasons and continually regulates itself, even in spite of the extraction that we have done for, for a long time and also reverence for the future, that I might have ideas, I might have um, expectations of what the future is gonna look like, but if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that those are, um, it is an unknown place, the future. And so having reverence for the potential unfolding and for the lack of knowingness that I don't know and I still trust and I still have awe and I still find miracle is really powerful. Um, and this is a place where you could add in your own denomination or your own spirituality, but I don't think that you need either of those things to be in awe of the miracle of the body or the miracle of, of nature um, or the fact that many people work together to have you <laughs> and come here today. Um, and that awe and that reverence and that honoring then leads us to have gratitude. And what I wrote here on gratitude is for the big and small things. And when we're in collective care, when we feel that we are in right relationship, that we're reciprocally giving and receiving care, there are so many things to be thankful for. And oftentimes, we actually are living in environments that have collective care right now, but because of fear that might be coming from the outside, like media, or um, fear of systemic oppressive structures, that we might get away from where we actually do have control and where we actually are collectively cared for. And so gratitude is a great way of naming those things. Um, so this could be, you know, thanking a, thanking a team member for allowing you to have extra time in your sharing. This could be um, thanking the trash man for doing his job in the context of a collective um, pandemic. This could be grateful for your flower for blooming. I had a um, orchid that bloomed 17 times this spring, which was such a gift. And by practicing that tool of noticing and acknowledging things in my environment that are, that are bringing me gratitude and connecting me to reverence, I allow myself to notice those more in my life. It lifts up the PBIS strategy five to one, right? So for every one negative interaction you have with a student, having five positive interactions with that student, thinking of that with your fear. So for every one thought of fear that I have, in order for me to create safety and regulation and right relationship, I have to find five things in my environment that create safety for me. 
And, um, and that can be things that are small. It doesn't need to be that everything is safe in order for you to have access safety. It can be small things like my, my friend is here. I have food to eat today. Um, I was able to breathe quietly by myself for three minutes before my four-year-old got up. Uh, <clears throat> finding those small ways to be grateful. And when we're in gratitude, it is a very normal, <clears throat> natural thing to want to tend to your environment. And so this is, I think, when I think of tending, I think of it as the healthiest version of care providing that I can really even define, where you're in your environment and you're so satisfied in, in right relationship with your environment that it's, you're either bringing things into order, puttering around your room, cleaning your room, um, cleaning, you know, going out into your environment and cleaning trash off of the street, um, or, you know, tending to people in your life because you have an authentic space to listen to. Um, tending is the place where we either bring things back into order and reset things to the way they were before, or we realize that the new current moment needs the course of adaptation. And that is something that I think is universal over cultures that embody and prioritize collective care over self-care, is that their willingness to collectively adapt to continue to attend and tend to their environment. Um, and we see this also in the animal kingdom. Where, a, where an animal or a species is evolving and they tend to their environment to make sure that there's more food for them the following season. And that if something dies out, that the evolution and the species that allows, is allowed to stay is the one that's able to adapt to that type of change. Um, and so I believe that, that changing and holding strong to who we are falls in the tending. And when we are intending of other people and when we are tended to, when we are being given gratitude as much as we give gratitude out, it is effortless for our gifts to shine through. And I think I have gifts in a really broad term here. So gifts could be, I have a backyard garden and I'm going to give my lemons and my kale out to everyone on my street because I have abundance and I can't wait to share. This could be a skill. Maybe you know how to knit. Maybe you cook really well. Um, maybe you're really good at making agendas or webinars. These are all gifts that when we come from a place of feeling tended by our community and tending it, that we feel grateful and we have reverence, that will naturally come forth as creative solutions to what we want to have different. And then I wanna add here also that a gift is also speaking our truth and telling our story. So it doesn't mean that this gift is always beautiful and sweet and bright and joyful. Your grief can be a gift. Your rage can be a gift. Your honest expression and your ability to speak what's true for you and come into alignment and advocate for what you need um, while tending to yourself is an unbelievable gift to yourself and to your community. And there is room because another gift is listening. So when we are tended to and we're great, gra there's gratitude in the environment, part of what we can gift others is listening to their truth and witnessing and receiving their skills. So, so many of us that are care providers, we're like, we need to have, we need to be caring for everyone and doing everything. Um, and maybe I'm just speaking about me, so feel free to, to, to disclaim that. Um, and we, have, we don't actually have the same amount of time or space that we could to receive. And so when we think of collective care, when we think about this as a way to embody not just only self-care but communal care, gifting a gift that we can offer is to be able to receive the gifts from other people. So I think a good example is... Um, I have a 10 year old stepdaughter, her name's Linza, and she was so excited um, when I saw her last to make breakfast. She wakes up super early and we have a request of her not waking us up till 7.30. And so she made us the most wonderful breakfast. Um, the breakfast was a little undercooked <laughs> and there was a very sugary like lemonade drink. Um, but my ability to receive the gift just as it was brought so much joy to myself and brought so much joy to Linza 
that it brought in a collective sense of communal care. Um, and so I want you to think of areas in your life right now, and you maybe want to add this into the chat box of where can you gift outside of yourself into your community in a unique way, but also where can you receive special gifts from your community that you wouldn't be receiving otherwise. So I would not be with Linza right now if um, in getting that breakfast if um, it wasn't COVID. Um, so let's look in the chat box and see what comes through. So I'm seeing beautiful stuff about gardening, um, playing with our kids. For my mom, it's cleaning the house. She really, one of her, one of the things she loves doing is organizing and cleaning um, as a way to show love. Mm. Reading books together with our kids, with teenagers, being silent together. Yes. Offering yoga classes to our students. Looking at artwork from our students. Having our kids home, our adult kids home from college or from other places in a way that they wouldn't before. Um, it's been a gift to be home with my mom during Mother's Day, so I deeply resonate with that. And learning uses of technology in different ways to share information and resources. All of these drawings would not exist without COVID. So I totally agree with that and validate. Beautiful. Yep, eating dinner as a family rather than commuting. So we can already see that collective care because of the pandemic bringing us together. Um, and I want to name that this is for those of us that have privilege as, you know, as people that have safe homes to live in and food to eat, that there has been a sense of understanding of collective care being a key ingredient to moving through this challenge and then choosing a new way of life. Um, and so that's been a really big gift that I just invite you maybe once a day to be like, what is a gift that I wouldn't have received if COVID hadn't happened as a way to counterbalance that five to one rule with the news and just with our own uncertainty and worry. And I just wanna give some context about why the teaching while still really encourages and talks about self-care and we'll end the session maybe with some meditation um, unless there's some question and answer that we wanna do is that collective care if collective care was held for all people in society um, and was held equally and justly and with freedom and with love for all people, it's really all that's needed, right? Um, so this idea, this American idea and European idea of the sense of self-actualization being the pinnacle of where we go as an or as a community is actually in communities that are more collectively based is not the pinnacle. And is if for, for many people is identifying a symptom of not enough collective care that people feel like they have to actualize themselves to create safety and feel worthy of life um, in the selfhood. So collective care is really all that's needed when society is in right, right relationship, both within itself, meaning how it tends to the individual body, how it tends to each other, how it tends to the nature and ecological environment around it, and then how it's an open system. So it gives and it receives information from the outside in a way that continues to bring adaptation, vitality, and in mutual exchange of resources. So self-care in the context of the environment we live in, in an industrial growth society, is a necessary distinction and it is especially a necessary distinction um, for those of us that are from a marginalized identity and for those of us that are service providers in a society that is not centered on service. Um, our society has been centered for quite some time on a consumerist model that is built to always ask for more, more external resources, more internal resources to give out. Um, and that we need more in order to be enough. 
And so self-care is a radical tool to come back towards collective care for yourself, for the community around you, right? Um, and is vital and really, really important. Let me see if I have another slide. Um, and I just wanna make a connection, but I'm looking at time and I just, I'm gonna be really brief on this because I wanna have more time for Q&A and then we'll end with the visualization is that inside a collective trauma, service providers are trained to fawn, meaning they go towards the chaos or towards the trauma. And um, this is actually a really amazing tool it is needed for societies to make their way through big crises. We need people who are frontline care providers. And what the thing to know about a fawn response is that it's more like a delayed release tablet and that it's gonna require additional processing for everything to be safe for other, safe, once everyone's safe for other people, it requires additional processing after. So once you've had that fawning experience, going home or being with your community and using collective care or self-care tools to move through other experiences, releasing of trauma is very vital for you to be able to show up and actually stay in a healthy fawn response to the trauma. If not, we take on that trauma, this is my visual for fawning, and we actually get vicarious trauma because we aren't doing the work, the uh, taking out the emotional trash, showering the day off, to be able to come back and provide soothing, calming care to that environment. And so when we imagine ourselves inside of this collective trauma, doing our personal work to inoculate ourselves from fear, activate our collective care and self-care tools, you can imagine that we cover our, in this fiery trauma, we're covering our hands in water and moss. And that because we do that, we invite other people around us to inoculate our, themselves in the same way, or even be inoculated from their fear by just being in relationship with you. Um, and I've really seen this inside the teaching well. There's, eight of us in our community. And I have found time and time again that when one of us feels dysregulated or overwhelmed by the, by the reality as it is, the uncertainty of being a small nonprofit, the um, uncertainty of job, the just the uncertainty of holding this for some, we're working with like 120 people one-on-one, -on -one, that this has been the thing that has kept our organization together and vital through this time. Um, so I'm gonna pause there. Yeah, there's, there's a question. Yeah. Um, there's actually some questions about acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, one question is, is FAWN an, an acronym? FAWN is not an acronym. So there's, uh, according to like Peter Levine and Besser van der Kolk's work, there's the three main responses to trauma, fight, fight, and freeze. Um, and what, there is an argument led by, um, why am I spacing on his name right now? Stephen, not Levine, Stephen Hayes, maybe I can send that. I'll put that in the living document. Um, that there is an additional fourth response to trauma called fawning. And his concept, because all, um, all key trauma responses are when they become our core trauma response, it's because it was the, the, the thing that created the most safety for us as young people, as children. So the like, that story, developmental storyline of bond trauma is the idea that there was someone in your environment that created chaos, that it might've been a primary care provider or a close sibling, and that you found that the safest way to survive your, chi survive your childhood was to tend to their needs and to become like, you know, the idea of like a parentified child um, or a child that like, has um, parents that have to focus on their, are focusing on their own needs rather than the need of the child first. And so um, if that is our primary, primary response to trauma, it's important to be able to know that we have access to other ways to release trauma. Um, but two, that we as a society train teachers, nurses, doctors to fawn towards trauma. So we train us as a teaching credential, you're like, this is an environment that doesn't have enough resources, that when a shooter, you know, when something happens that's really big, that you go towards the chaos to soothe it for other people. And so I'm mapping this concept of like developmental trauma onto like a collective um, body of work 
you know, work providers. And many of us who step into the field of educator and nurse can have that developmental background as well. Thank you. I think there was another acronym question, which I didn't see in the presentation of the um, person who asked it once, like maybe OPIC, was that? If that person can clarify, I would love yeah. to. If there were any other questions about acronyms, I didn't see them shared in the presentation, but if you have questions about acronyms or any other question and you'd like to raise your hand or throw it in the chat, feel free. We have another few minutes. I see um, Michelle Lee asked about marginalized identity with question marks. So that's just a framing for those people, for those of us, society is caring for a circle group of people. Um, and that's oftentimes in the society we are now based on race and class. And so for those people whose identities, maybe it's queer identity, a racial identity, um, or a disability, who are outside of that sphere of normal, of what like a normal care looks like in a society, they are oftentimes at cause or more affected by the oppressive structures of that system. Um, and so we're talking about the margins of the edge of the circle. Mm -hmm. EOPIC is the acronym. Do we know where that where, where it came from? B in the presentation. I don't see. I might have said BIPOC, uh, BIPOC of Black, Indigenous, People of Color identity. I might have said that. That's the, what comes to mind. I don't see it. I'm look, trying to look at the chat box. Well, I don't see that acronym in, in there. Kim, let us know if there's clarifying question. Okay. We think that's okay. We think that's right. Um, I'm open. I would love to be able to receive questions from the audience. Um, if someone wants to actually take themselves off mute and be able to ask a question or even just share what's coming up for you, I would love to create space for that. Hi, my name is Winnie Davis. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Winnie. Okay, um, I just have a quick question. I like this presentation and what we're doing right now on this uh, video on Zoom. Do you also make um, arrangements to come out to schools? Because right now I'm with a middle school and I'm thinking about transferring back to my elementary school. But I think this would be really, I, I like this. It, was, it's, it, it, touched, it touched me a lot today. And I was wondering, do you come out to schools? Like, you know, when we get back to our normal life. We do, so that's a great question. In the living document, the, at the top first page, it says survey, um, like a survey form to fill out. Okay. And I'll actually, I'm gonna stop sharing with y'all. Um, and I'm going to share with you that survey response. So if you guys could fill this out, this would be really meaningful to me. And at the end of this, um, at the end of it, it says, would you like us to touch base with you about us coming to your site or working, you know, working in an individual way, or if you want to join our newsletter, totally open. We've been working inside of Oakland for the last four years um, and now work with schools all around the Bay Area. Um, so yeah, we'd love to help you, Winnie, and thank you so much for sharing the value of this training. Thank you. Maybe one more question and then we'll close. You can hear my three-year-old in the background. Awesome. And it's the best. I'm going to end us, since I don't hear any questions, I'm going to just end us with a breathing um, activity. And um, feel free, please, to also take this time and go fill out the survey if you really have to end at noon. I would really appreciate that. But for those of us that have a little extra time, I'm just gonna invite you, if you feel comfortable, to readjust yourself in your seat and stretch, potentially for the first time in the last hour. I'm gonna invite you to reach your arms overhead if you can. 
and always going to your ability level. And then I'm gonna ask you to use cactus arms, bringing your elbows out to the height of your shoulder and then just gently opening, lifting the chin towards your ceiling. Exhaling here. Inhale, reach the arms overhead. One more time. Exhale, cactus arms opening the chest, looking up to the ceiling. Inhale, reaching up. And then exhale, curling the spine one vertebrae at a time. And an overextension. Maybe gently doing some twists and turns. And then we'll take three breaths to close together. This first, first breath is just for you, taking a deep breath in. And exhale, letting it out. This next breath is for your community. For those that you care about, inhaling deeply in to help with care and exhale for your community, letting it go. And then this final breath is a breath in to the uncertainty or the unknown, the reverence for something larger than us. Exhale, letting it go with gratitude. When you're ready, gently opening your eyes. I'll stay on for extra, or well, we can't stay on maybe, for because there's a thing at noon. Um, I know, I'm not sure there is a stress um, uh, stress management for educators workshop um, being hosted by Kaiser Permanente um, and Alliance for Healthy Generation uh, right now at noon. Um, and I linked the virtual staff health and wellness fair um, link it's also in your email through OUSD news and through the superintendent um, please access it there's lots of amazing resources there uh, fill, complete the feedback survey if there's any feedback you want to provide um, it's a sort of living site as well and will be up until uh, June 15th at least through the end of open enrollment um, so check it out there's a lot of great self-care and community care uh, resources there um, a lot of information about your benefits and um, changing your benefits during open enrollment if you um, if you need to. Um, thank you so much, Kelly, for sharing um, yeah. your, um, I mean, I know it's, this concept is evolving for you and these conversations, I, um, I know Kelly to take in the questions and the information and then to um, digest it and then um, work on like new concepts and um, content. So. Um, thank you so much for um, for sharing with us this thank concept you. of herd immunity, um, but social emotional herd immunity. Yes, thank you so much um, for everyone for staying on, staying and being here. And I'll be on for another five minutes or so if you want to stay on and ask questions um, in a more private environment. And if not, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Oh, how are the babies? How's Deshaun and Jenea? Good.